I could talk to you a little bit in Russian tonight. I could say, Dobre uh, and uh, you would say, hmm, well, I wonder what he said, and I would say, good evening to you. You know, that's what I would be saying. Uh, the only thing I can say in Russian is, Dim Vishnovi Perushuk Poljalsta, and that means one cherry pie, please, uh, which is uh, what I order in McDonald's pretty frequently that's just right around the corner from the school. It, it's a joy to be with you. When Wayne came over to College Hill, he was going west, and he allowed an hour and a half, and I think it took him about an hour. So uh, Sue and I thought, man, we don't want to be late, and so we are going east, and no telling what the traffic will be, and so uh, we uh, headed out of North Richland Hills at 5.30, and we were here at 6.10. And uh, <laughs> so I've gotten a little tour of the city, I've looked at your building, I've, you know, just all of those sort of things. It's a joy to be with you. I appreciate so much that, that opportunity to be here. You know, I, I've observed a lot of changes in my life. I've been preaching since 1963. The third Sunday in December 1963 was the first sermon that I preached. So I'm in my 49th year, if my math is correct, and it usually isn't. But I've noticed an awful lot of changes have happened. Uh, there was a time when... Uh, I would get up uh, before and people would lead a prayer in my behalf and they would say, Father, uh, we want you to guard, guide, and direct us. We want you to be with those who are sick of this congregation. Y'all didn't catch that one, did you? <laughs> and we pray that our preacher will have a long and useful life in the service of the Lord. And then at some point in time, I don't really know when that was, all of a sudden they said, and Father, we pray that he'll have a ready recollection. And I began to get the hint that maybe, you know, I needed to use more notes and that sort of stuff. So, so I do that. I, I had Panicsville today. Uh, I've had a little crisis. Uh, Sue and I and uh, one of our elders and one of our deacons are going to Kiev uh, here in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be teaching a seminar there for um, the Vinograder congregation <clears throat> on Friday night and Saturday night, and then on that Sunday they're celebrating their 10th anniversary as a congregation, which is uh, significant. And uh, so I'm trying to get my stuff put together, and I'm wanting to put as much of it in Russian as I can, and my Bible program actually has the Russian synodal in it. But when I traded computers recently, I upgraded beyond what their fonts would handle, that's the letters, and so I've been fighting a battle for the last couple of days trying to get that to work. <clears throat> and so I finally got in contact with a man that helps them with their uh, problems and difficulties. And uh, he called me today. And I had about five screens opened and I was working diligently on this lesson tonight. And so I thought I saved everything perfectly. <clears throat> I got on the phone with him. After another 35, 40 minutes, he and I had finally solved the problem. I'm going to be able to show the scriptures out of the Russian synodal uh, in the PowerPoint. So I'm just, I was so excited about that, and I couldn't find my sermon outline. That ready recollection was gone. I thought, man, we're in trouble. So I started hastily trying to, to uh, retype it and, and repaste the scriptures in it and all that sort of stuff. And then after a little bit, I thought, you know, if I look in the documents, maybe it went there. And it did, and I am, am safe. Y'all are good. Uh, we, have, we have notes with us tonight, so we can make this happen. Thank you again for allowing me to be with you. If you have a Bible, you might want to turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'd like for you to read along with me. Philippians chapter 2. If you don't, I just listen very carefully. And uh, we want to uh, begin at that juncture. Uh, the book of Philippians is always a, a tremendous study because it's a study about Christian relationships, relationship with God and relationships with one another. And the Apostle Paul makes this book special because the book of Philippians is written about his relationship with the church at Philippi. And so here he is in this Roman prison and, and he's so concerned about these brethren. He, he, he loves them and they are, they are a shining uh, example of what Christ and Christianity ought to be. And he's thrilled about this church. But he's also very concerned about this church. And so in chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, listen to what Paul says to them. So then, my beloved, 
Just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. I have the feeling that Paul understood how dark the world was without the light of Christ. I know that he understood that they had their problems with the sensual that they had their problems with the evil. They had their problems with people who did not respect righteousness. People who would argue with you about the existence of God. People who would live lives of such tremendous immorality that, that it would make you cringe to think about the evil things that were going on. As Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, you remember he talked about that darkness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he talked about the evilness even among those who are part of the body. And so he begins to challenge them here. And in Philippians chapter 2, he says, I, I want you to be responsive to Christ as if I were there with you. Now, Paul probably had such influence that that was a legitimate statement for him to make. Because when he was with them, they would say, you know, we don't want the Apostle Paul getting on our case while he's here in town. We want to behave. We want to be, be someone who's representing Christ a little bit better. And so they would do a little bit better job. But sometimes when he would be away, he was fearful that they wouldn't. So he tells them, I, I want you to work for God's pleasure. I want you to illustrate Jesus to this world. I want you to make Jesus a very dynamic part of your life. I want you to encourage one another because you need to remember your light. Your light in the midst of a world that is overwhelmed with darkness. And so I want you to hold fast God's word. You know, our challenge is to be spiritual examples in a physical world. It's us that must be illustrating Jesus to the world. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 if you want to follow along with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, another favorite passage. Chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Usually when we look at this passage, we concentrate on the thoughts of verse 17. The old has passed away, the new has come. When we've become a Christian, when we've been buried in that watery grave of baptism, we've been raised to walk, as it were, in newness of life. We're, we're a Christian. And we're new. And that's true. But I'm afraid far too many people think that we are raised to be new and then we rust. We don't really assume our responsibility and assume our task of trying to be what God calls us to be by the gospel. And so Paul tells these good folks, here's what you are. You're ambassadors for Christ. You've been raised to walk in newness of life so that you will be the personal representative of the Lord Jesus Christ here upon this earth. And as His representative, you need to realize the responsibility that you have is great. And you're going to need to exercise your responsibility 
consistently, constantly. And so being raised to walk in newness of life is a challenge for us. But you know, the reason that we are able to be that ambassador, if indeed we are being the ambassador, is not because we have been raised to newness and then we rust, but because we've been raised to newness and we are renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, we do not lose heart. Though our outward man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. I read a marvelous story about two or three months ago, and I have used it, and I have thought about it a lot. The story is told of a factory worker who had a day off, and there was a preacher who needed transportation from where he was to about 60 miles away. And so someone asked the, the factory worker, said, would you be willing to take him from point A to point B? It's a rather lengthy trip, but you can do it. And he said, I'd be delighted to. I, I would enjoy talking to him. Well, it so happens that the path that they needed to take, the road went right by the factory where this guy worked. And so as they drove down the road, he, he pointed to a building. He says, you see the gray brick building between the two red brick buildings there? Yes, yes, I see that. He says, that's the building that I work in. He says, I work on the seventh floor of that building. There are thousands and thousands of employees, but he says, in my department, there are 74 employees. And to my knowledge... I am the only Christian. I am the only churchgoer that works in my department. Preacher said, wow, that, that, that's significant. He says, oh yes, sir. Because you see what I realize, because I am the only one in my department, I am the only representative of Christ there. So I've got to do a good job when I'm on the job doing the things that I'm supposed to do because God has asked me to, to be a faithful employee to my employer. But he says even more so, I've got to do that so that I can, can be the, the illustration to these fellows of what a Christian is like. He says, you know, it's, it's a big responsibility. He says, well, I have to do a good job. He says, and I have to watch my language, and I have to watch my attitude, and, and, and I have to try to be what Jesus wants me to be because I'm his ambassador there, and I'm the only one there who represents Christ. Read that story, and I said, you know, that fellow got it. He understands what this, this task of being a representative and ambassador for Christ is. He understands what that role and that responsibility is. Of course, the thing that crosses my mind is that we need to let that tribe increase. We need to let more people realize that they are ambassadors for Christ, that we are ambassadors for Christ. In everything that we do. Well, that gets us to our text. I, I, in developing this sermon, began to think about Christians being representatives of Christ on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And the question that came to my mind is, what's going to motivate us to do that? What's going to cause us to want to be that physical representative of Christ. Well, in our great text, beginning with verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do men light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and give, your glo give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's set the context here for just a little bit. You remember it well. Jesus here in this great passage has just given his disciples, we call them beatitudes, but I'd like to call them character traits. We say the blessed are's. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. We could go on down the list. He's just given them that list. Now, sometimes when we look at this word blessed, we say, well, what is blessedness? And, and people will say to us, well, it's joy, it's happiness. I say, nah, I don't think that's what he was talking about. If you begin to read some of the, the, the Greek etymologists who look at the meanings of words in a significant way, they will tell you that this word blessed means being filled with the contentment of God being filled to the fullness with God's fullness. That makes sense to me. Because being filled with God's fullness allows me to be a person who mourns, allows me to be a person who's poor in spirit. Because I would have some conflict being poor in spirit and being happy, or mourning and being happy. They seem like oxymorons to me. But when you understand that he's talking about filled with all of the fullness of God, these character traits that God has given to us, the Beatitudes as we call them, these character traits say, this is the type of person that I want you as my disciples to be. I want you to be this sort of individual. There's power there. There's power there. But then when he gets through this list, and he talks about the persecuting of the prophets. He just looks boldly into our faces and he says, you are the salt. You are the salt. Uh, we've kind of gone through a period of time where some people have been trying to tell us that, that we didn't have very good identity. We didn't really know who we were, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, I, I usually say to those fellows, I don't know about you, but I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I had a fellow one time when we were having this discussion say, well, then tell me, what are you? And I looked at him, I said, I'm salt. Bless his heart, he didn't catch on to what I was saying. I said, I'm salt. I says, I'm light. I'm new. I'm in Christ. I'm a part of the household of faith, the body of believers. I just kept going on and on. I said, how many more of these do you want, my friend? He didn't really understand that. But Jesus looks at us and he says, you're salt. I think it's interesting that Jesus uses this word salt because of what people would think about the second they thought about salt. Some of y'all may be old enough to have heard a preacher preach a sermon on You're the Salt of the Earth that was presented by the Morton Salt Company. And they had a pretty good sermon. They gave you eight qualities of salt. We're not going to look at all eight. We just want to look at three real quickly. When you stop and think about salt, you stop and think about the fact that it purifies, uh, that it can preserve, and most of all, it gives flavor. I'm guessing that some of you have gone to your medical doctor and your doctor says, your problem is you're eating too much salt. You've got too much flavor. And I want you to lose weight, so I'm going to take away your salt Everything's going to taste terrible and you just won't eat. I don't know if that works or not. I haven't tried it. Don't plan on it. My doctor sprinkles salt quite liberally and I follow his example, not his teaching. Salt has a powerful, powerful impact upon our world and our lives. Stop and think about it. It's influence. It's influence. And so when Jesus looks at us and he says, you are salt, he is saying to you, you're influence. Now I know what most of us are thinking. We're thinking, well, I want to be an influence in this world, but I can't do just big, marvelous, uh, wonderful things. I, I'm just a common old person. Stop and think about where salt does its best work. 
at the dining room table. Not even something that we give much thought to. But yet we get those green beans on there and we take a taste and we say, hmm, this needs a little bit more salt. And it begins to change that which is around it. And that's what Jesus was saying to us. He's saying, you are the salt of the earth. It's a description of your work of influence. So that big pot of beans is changed in flavor with a little salt. It only takes a little salt for us to change a whole community, a whole neighborhood, a whole workplace. And it isn't done by the extraordinary events, but salt does its work in the common activities of everyday life. Salt is something that you and I can be. Because we can be influential in the lives of everyone that we come in contact with. So stop and think about it. As salt, you go up to the grocery checker and she's frowning because the person who was just there has told her what a bad job she did. And what can you do? You can change their night today. I've done it more than once. In fact, when I was in Claremore, Oklahoma, <laughs> there was a girl who gave me the wrong change and we finally made the right change. And the next thing you know, uh, she was in a better mood because I treated her with a lot of love and kindness and respect, invited her to services. She didn't come, but her manager did, and I baptized the manager and his wife. Salt. Salt. Being influence in this world. The story is told of a Christian man who was with a group of business associates they just finished their business. They were running late to the airport. They were running even later to the airplane. They were trying to do that run through the airport business. And in the process, there was a little girl who had severe handicaps and difficulties trying to sell a few wares there. And one of the guys just completely scattered her stuff with his foot everywhere you could possibly imagine. And one of the fellows wanted to get home to his wife so very desperately. He had been gone all week. But he looked at the plight of the little girl and she was crying because her wares were everywhere and he stops. The other guys say, what are you doing? We're going to miss our plane. He said, call my wife when you get there. Tell her I'll be on the next flight, but I have something important to do. And he stops and he picks up all of these wares and he helps the little girl get her money back in the, the pot. And, and he pulls a 20 out of his pocket and he puts it in the pot. He misses his airplane. But then he hears the words of the little girl as he's helped her get everything put together. Mister, are you Jesus? I don't know whether he was a Christian or not, but he did the right thing. But what I would say to you that those of us who are Christians have the ability to influence the people that we're around when we're trying to be salt. So as one fellow put it, the salt is no good if it never leaves the salt shaker. And that's a problem that we sometimes have in the body of Christ because we sit here in the pew and we listen to the Word of God and then we walk out the door and we forget what manner man we are. Remember James talking about the mirror illustration? We need to be salt. So let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, Jesus, uh, Paul says. Jesus speaks through Paul so that you will know how you ought to respond to each person. But then there's kind of a little problem with this text for some folks. Skeptics have used this. Jesus says, but if the salt has lost its savor, technically speaking, and I tried to look that up today and I found a certain amount of evidence that confirmed it, salt cannot lose its saltiness. Sodium chloride just can't do that unless it's reconfigured, and if it's reconfigured, it's not salt. Jesus, what are you talking about? 
Well, I found an explanation that makes sense, so I'm going to share it with you and see what you think. In Jesus' time, much of the salt used by the common people was not very pure. It was a mixture of minerals that contained much lower levels of actual salt. So if this mineral mix was exposed to water, the sodium chloride would leach out, and that would leave a white residue that looked like salt, but had none of salt's flavor or abilities. It had none of its influence. And they would take this white powder and they would put it on their sidewalks and on their, their walkways because it helped to settle the dust, but that's all it was good for. I don't know if that explanation is totally correct, but it makes sense to me, it sounds logical. What good is it if we, we are the salt of the earth and yet when we leave the place where we have received more saltiness here and we go out into this world that so desperately is in need of some influence for righteousness and we don't try to influence people for righteousness, what good is it? What have we accomplished? You see, Jesus says that, that, that this stuff is going to lose its influence and when it loses its influence... It's not accomplishing its purpose. So you and I are to be greatly concerned about whether or not we are salt and we're allowing the salt to be sprinkled out of the shaker as we go through life. Influence. Verse 14, Jesus then says, second person, telling you who you are, he says, you are the light of of the world. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put a basket on top of it, but they put it on a lampstand. Why? So it'll give light to all who are in the room. I was raised in the great state of New Mexico. I love New Mexico. If you don't like New Mexico, don't tell me because I want to like you. Okay? There is a road in the great state of New Mexico that goes from Roswell, New Mexico to Vaughn, New Mexico. Anyone ever been over that road? 99 miles of nothing. Am I not right? There's 12 trees, or at least there used to be. I don't know if those trees are still alive or not. There are 12 trees. But I've made that drive at night. We used to go from Artesia, my hometown, up to Albuquerque pretty frequently for school conventions and functions and specialists and all sorts of things and so I've been over that road a lot at night. It's amazing. There are ranch houses four, five, six miles off of that highway and they'll have one little old light out there on the end of the barn and you can see it for 20 miles. It never ceased to amaze me. And I've had people with me when we were driving down the road that say, well, boy, I'm glad someone's close by. And I said, that light right there, that light's about 16 miles from where we are. No! I'd say, check the speedometer. Let's see how long we can see that light. You know? If I had been a betting person, I would have bet money. But I'm not a betting person. I don't believe in that, okay? Sure enough. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. One night, <clears throat> my wife and I and some dear friends had bought some tickets to Garth Brooks in the old Texas stadium. And they invited us to go, and as we came in, they handed us a cigarette lighter. And I wondered what in the world they giving out cigarette lighters, especially to people who despise smoking. I thought we were in real trouble. I didn't realize that this is a culture deal. But after a little while, they turned out all the lights and had everyone turn on their little bitty lights. I was amazed at how much light everyone in that audience was giving off with their individual light makers. Wow! And the thought occurred to me, most of us think, well, I, I can't be a big light but what did I say a while ago about salt and light? It doesn't do its work with the extraordinary, the phenomenal. It does its work when each individual light accomplishes its purpose. 
So Jesus says this light is going to be something that is extremely, extremely visible, something that you can see from a long, long distance, something that you need to be concerned about, that you are accomplishing in your life. As you go around in this world, you are the light of the world. Light is the visible manifestation of God in our lives so that it illumines other people's lives. And where do we get it? We get it from Jesus. Jesus had just challenged the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. <clears throat> Everybody else has gone home. He's already dealt with them real quick. He pretty well told them, you aren't light. He tells this woman, go and sin no more. You remember that? Have you ever noticed the very next statement, verse 12? Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So you and I become Christians. We become God's servant. And what have we done? We have come to spiritual light. We, we've come to the one who really illumines things. And what are we to do with it? Jesus has already told us. He says, you're, you're to take that light and light the world. Light everybody else up. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. I like that. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Listen to verse 7. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible of the 789 favorite verses I have, okay? If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Wow. Wow. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. There is power when we have light. As I was looking at some materials today, I found some, some stories that really captivated my attention, but one of them really captivated me and, and made me think about how important it is that you and I assume our role and our responsibility of being light. 2001, Saturday, September 15th, 2.30 a.m. Y'all might remember the story. There was a tragedy between Port Isabel and Padre Island. A boat hit one of the pillars that was making the bridge and caused the bridge to break in the middle. You remember that? It was the darkest hour of the night. Cars were coming to the peak of the bridge. They could not see. There was no light. Nine people lost their lives and drove across before someone figured out that the bridge was not there. When I read that story, I thought, you know, the spiritual application is, is this. If you and 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 you are not trying to be light in your world, in your neighborhood, in your grocery store, in your home, how many people will drive off the bridge before they discover that there's no bridge there? I think about this world in which we live and I think, wow, how we need to be light everywhere that we are. If a person cannot remember to say thank you to the housekeeper, it probably won't matter much if she writes a major philosophical treatise on kindness, will it? If a man is rude to his family, the angels won't give any attention to his preaching, soaring sermons on the nature of love. You see, we've got to be salt and we've got to be light and this world desperately is in need of the salt and desperately in need of the light. I want to close tonight with <clears throat> another illustration that I've read several times recently and it's been in several different formats so I don't know which one's true, don't know whether it's true or not, but man it illustrates the point for me. It seems there was a preacher in Texas <clears throat> who was in a huge hurry after work at the office in the day 
he had to get to the mall for some items. Then he had to go to his daughter's school to pick her up. Then he had to take her home. Then he had to go to a meeting. Then he had to spend the evening in counseling sessions. Once in the mall, though, he saw an advertisement on a music store window that said, two CDs for $9.99. He loved music. Decided he'd take advantage of it. So he went in and he picked up two CDs he had really been wanting. And he went to pay for them. He threw down his money while he talked to everyone around him. That's the way preachers are. Then he picked up his bag and his change and went out of the mall, threw the bag in the front seat of the car, and suddenly he noticed for the first time that the clerk had only charged him $1.99 instead of $9.99 for those CDs. His first thought was that, I'm really busy. I've got a lot of things to do. I just don't have time to go back into the mall and get this taken care of. Maybe I can do it tomorrow. Maybe I can do it next week. But somehow, the conscience in him, the salt and the light that he had accepted as his responsibility, kept saying, no, you don't have time not to go back into the mall. 